This is the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter, 2021. Lesson 7 from the series Rest in Christ is titled Rest, Relationships and Healing, ready for teaching on August 14, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, August 7. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word again. We thank you that as we open it, we can discover more about who you are and how our lives can revolve around who you are and your guidance and your leadership, but also your forgiveness. And as we study about forgiveness and relationships this week, as we see what your word has to say, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our memory text this week is Genesis chapter 45 and verse 5. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. Let's read that again, Genesis 45 verse 5. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. A man had been accused of sexually assaulting a woman. She positively identified him in a police lineup. Though evidence made his guilt questionable, the woman was adamant that Johnny was the guilty party. And so Johnny went to prison, where he rotted for 14 years for a crime that he did not commit. Only when DNA evidence exonerated him did the woman Joan realise her terrible mistake. She wanted to meet Johnny after he had been released. What would this man, who had suffered so much, do when he came face to face with the woman who had ruined his life for so many years? She was in a room waiting for him to come in. When he did, and they looked each other in the eyes, Joan burst into tears. Johnny just leaned down and took my hands, and he looked at me and said, I forgive you. I couldn't believe it. He was this man whom I had hated and whom I would wanted only to die, and yet now here he was telling me who had done him so much wrong that he forgave me. Only then did I begin to understand what grace was really about, and only then did I begin to heal and have true rest. This week we will look at forgiveness and what it can do for restless human hearts. Sunday, August 8. Facing the Past Eventually, things moved in the right direction for Joseph, big time. He not only got out of prison, but he also was made Prime Minister of Egypt after interpreting Pharaoh's dreams. And that story is recorded in Genesis chapter 41. Why don't we read that? Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. He slept and dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day, when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, we each had a dream in one night, he and I. Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. 
and it came to pass, just as he had interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to my office, and he hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I stood on the bank of the river. Suddenly seven cows came up out of the river, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then, behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such ugliness as I have never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the first seven, the fat cows. When they had eaten them up, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were just as ugly as at the beginning. So I awoke. Also I saw in my dream, and suddenly seven heads came up on one stalk, full and good. Then, behold, seven heads, withered thin and blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. So I told this to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. And the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice, because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. Let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities." then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand, put it in Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried out before him, Bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zephnath paneah And he gave him as a wife, Azanath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Joseph was thirty years old when he stood before King Pharaoh of Egypt, and Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. He laid it up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. 
And to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, when Azanath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all my toil in all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Then the seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt ended, and the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. The famine was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was vanished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. The famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain, because the famine was severe in all lands. He was married and had two children of his own, as he read in verses 50 and 52. The storehouses of Egypt were full, and the predicted famine had begun. And then one day, Joseph's brothers turned up in Egypt. Question. Read about the first encounter between Joseph and his brothers since they sold him into slavery in Genesis 42, verses 7 to 20. Why the elaborate plot? What was Joseph trying to do with their first meeting? Genesis 42, beginning at verse 7. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, Where do you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Then Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, No, my lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. But he said to them, No, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, Your servants are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan, and in fact the youngest is with our father today, and one is no more. So Joseph said to them, It is as I spoke to you, saying, You are spies. In this manner you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you, and let him bring your brother, and you shall be kept in prison, that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you, or else, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison three days. Then Joseph said to them the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house, but you go and carry grain for the famine of your houses, and bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. Joseph had the power, and could have taken his revenge on his brothers without having to justify himself. But rather than revenge, Joseph was concerned about the members of his family at home. He was worried about his father. Was he still alive? Or had a dysfunctional family become a family without a patriarch? And what about his brother Benjamin? As his father's delight and joy, Benjamin was now in the same position that Joseph had been. Had the brothers transferred their dangerous jealousy to Benjamin? Joseph was now in a position to look out for these vulnerable people in his family. And he did just that. Practicing biblical principles in our relationships will not mean that we ever can or should accept abuse. Each one of us is precious in God's sight. Jesus paid the ultimate price on the cross for each one of us. Question. Why does Jesus take abuse or neglect of others so personally? Read Matthew 25, 41 to 46. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. 
Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. We have all been bought through Jesus' blood, and legally we are all his. Anyone who is abusive is attacking Jesus' property. Sexual abuse and emotional or physical violence are never to be a part of family dynamics. This is not just private family business to be resolved internally. This will require outside help and intervention. If you or someone in your family is being abused, please get help from a trusted professional. And so to finish the day, what are some biblical principles that you need to apply to whatever difficult family relationships you are now experiencing? Monday, August 9. Setting the Stage Joseph had forgiven his brothers. We don't know exactly when Joseph forgave them, but it was obviously long before they showed up. Joseph probably would never have thrived in Egypt if he had not forgiven, because, most likely, the anger and bitterness would have eaten away at his soul and damaged his relations with the Lord. Several studies of survivors of tragedy inflicted on them by others have highlighted the fact that for victims of the most horrible suffering, forgiveness was a key factor to find healing and to get their lives together again. Without forgiveness, we remain victims. Forgiveness has more to do with ourselves than with the person or persons who have wronged us. Even though Joseph had forgiven his brothers, he was not willing to let the family relationships pick up where he had left them, that is, at the dry pit at Dothan. He had to see if anything had changed. Question. What did Joseph overhear? Read Genesis 42, verses 21 to 24. What did he learn about his brothers? Genesis 42, beginning at verse 21. Then they said to one another, We are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore his, this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Do I not speak to you, saying, Do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. And he turned himself away from them and wept. Then he returned to them again and talked with them, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. All communication had been taking place through an interpreter, and so Joseph's brothers were unaware that he could understand them. Joseph heard his brother's confession. The brothers had thought that by getting rid of Joseph, they would be free from his reporting to their father. They thought that they would not have to put up with his dreams or watch him revel in the role of being his father's favourite. But instead of finding rest, they had been plagued by a guilty conscience all those years. Their deed had led to restlessness and a paralysing fear of God's retribution. Joseph actually felt sorry for their suffering. He wept for them. Joseph knew that the famine would still last several more years, and so he insisted that they bring Benjamin back with them the next time they came to buy grain, as we read in verse 20, And bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. He also kept Simeon hostage, as we've just read in verse 24. After seeing that Benjamin was still alive, he organised a feast in which he obviously showed favouritism to Benjamin to see if the old patterns of jealousy were still there, as we read in chapter 43, verse 34. 
Then he took servings to them from before him, but Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs, so they drank and were merry with him. The brothers didn't show any signs of being jealous, but Joseph knew how cunning they could be. After all, they did deceive a whole town, as you read in chapter 34, verse 13. But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor his father, and spoke deceitfully, because he had defiled Dinah their sister, and surely figured that they must have lied to their own father about his fate, as we read in chapter 37, verses 31 to 34. So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colours, and they brought it to their father, and said, We have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognized it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. So he devised one more major test, as we find in Genesis chapter 44. And let's read this test. We'll begin with verse 1. And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Also put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, and his grain money. So he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. When they had gone out of the city, and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, Get up, follow the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is not this the one from which my Lord drinks, and with which he indeed practices divination? You have done evil in so doing. So he overtook them, and he spoke to them these same words. And they said to him, Why does my Lord say these words? Far be it from us that your servants should do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouth of the sacks. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? With whomever of your servants it is found, let him die, and we will also be your Lord's slaves. And he said, Now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave, and you shall be blameless. Then each man speedily let down his sack to the ground, and each opened his sack. So he searched. He began with the oldest, and left off with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and each man loaded his donkey, and returned to the city. So Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, and he was still there, and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said to them, What deed is this you have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice divination? Then Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants." Here we are, my Lord's slaves, both we and he also, with whom the cup was found. But he said, Far be it from me that I should do so. The man in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. And as for you, go up in peace to your father. Then Judah came near to him and said, O my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing, and do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have you a father and a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, who is young. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. So it was, when we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of my Lord, and our father said, Go back and buy us a little food. But we said we cannot go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down. For we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. 
Then your servant my father said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. But if you take this one also from me, and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my grey hair with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to your servant my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen, when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. So your servants will bring down the grey hair of your servant our father with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad of my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father for ever. Now therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me? lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father. And so to finish today, read Genesis 45 verses 1 to 15. What does this tell us about how Joseph felt about his brothers and the forgiveness he had given them? What lessons should we take away from this story for ourselves? Genesis 45, beginning at verse 1. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him, while Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither ploughing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me, you and your children, your children's children, your flocks and your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty. For there are still five years of famine." And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that you have seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck, and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers, and wept over them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. What lessons should we take away from this story for ourselves? Tuesday, August 10. Forgive and forget. Forgiveness has been defined as the willingness to abandon one's right to resentment, condemnation and revenge toward an offender or group who acts unjustly. Dr. Marilyn Armour, a family therapist who worked with the Holocaust survivors, in order to find out what these survivors had done to make sense of what had happened to them, writes, The whole idea of forgiveness is an intentional act by the victim. It's not something that just happens. End of quote. Forgiveness doesn't mean that there will be no consequences. Forgiveness doesn't mean letting an abuser continue abusive patterns. Forgiveness means instead that we turn our resentment and our desire for revenge over to God. If not, the anger, the bitterness, the resentment and the hatred will make whatever that person or persons did to us even worse. 
Question. What does forgiving others do for us? Consider Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry, and delivered him to the torturers, until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you, if each of you, from his heart, does not forgive his brother his trespasses. No question. One of the keys in learning to forgive is to understand what we have been forgiven in Christ. We have all sinned, not just against other people, but against God as well. Every sin is, indeed, a sin against our Lord and Maker, and yet in Jesus we can claim total forgiveness for all those sins, not because we deserve it, we don't, but only because of God's grace toward us. Once we can grasp that sacred truth, once we can make this forgiveness our own, once we can experience for ourselves the reality of God's forgiveness, we can begin to let go and forgive others. We forgive not because others deserve it, but because it's what we have received from God and what we need ourselves. And besides, how often do we deserve forgiveness as well? As we saw too, Joseph offered a second chance for the family relations. No grudges here, no falling back to things that happened in the past. It is almost impossible to begin again in a family when we have each become experts at learning how best to hurt each other. But that's not how Joseph reacts. It seems that he wants to put the past behind him and to move ahead with love and acceptance. Had Joseph had a different attitude, this story would have had a different ending, one not so happy. Romans 4, 7 and 8 reads, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. What is Paul telling us about what we have been given in Jesus and how this wonderful promise could impact how we relate to those who have hurt us? Wednesday, August 11, Making It Practical In order to forgive, I must admit that I have been hurt. This can be hard to do, as we are sometimes more inclined to try to bury our feelings rather than work through them. Acknowledging unchristian feelings of resentment and even anger before God is fine. We see this often expressed in the Psalms. I can feel free to tell God that I didn't like what happened or how I was treated, and that makes me sad or angry or both. In Joseph's story, we see him crying as he sees his brothers again and relives some of the feelings of his past. Question. 
What does Jesus' declaration on the cross tell us about the timing of forgiveness? Luke 23 verse 34, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. Jesus didn't wait for us to ask for forgiveness first. We do not have to wait for our offender to ask for forgiveness. We can forgive others without having them accept our forgiveness. 2. What do Luke 6.28 and Matthew 5.44 teach about how we relate to those who hurt us? Luke 6.28 Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. And Matthew 5.44 But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Forgiveness, like love, begins with a choice rather than a feeling. We can make the choice to forgive, even if our emotions may not agree with this decision. God knows that in our own strength, this choice is impossible. But with God all things are possible, it says in Mark 10.27. This is why we are told to pray for those who have hurt us. In some cases this person may already have died, but we can still pray for the ability to forgive him or her. No question, forgiveness isn't always easy. The pain and the damage done to us can be devastating, leaving us hurt, crippled and broken. Healing will come if we allow it, but holding on to bitterness and anger and resentment will make healing much harder, if possible at all. The cross is the best example of what it cost God himself to forgive us. If the Lord can go through that for us, even though he knew that so many would nevertheless reject him, then we certainly can learn to forgive as well. And so to finish the day... Whom do you need to forgive, if not for that person's sake, then for your own? Thursday, August 12, Finding Rest After Forgiveness Joseph's family finally arrived in Egypt. There were no more dark secrets in the family. His brothers must have admitted to having sold Joseph when they explained to their father that the son he thought had been killed was now Prime Minister of Egypt. While it may not always be possible or wise to restore relationships, this does not mean that we cannot forgive. We may not be able to hug and weep with our offender, but we may want to voice our forgiveness either vocally or through a letter. And then it is time to let go of pain to the utmost degree we can. Perhaps some pain will always remain, but at least we can be on the path to healing. Question, read Genesis 50, verses 15 to 21. What are Joseph's brothers worried about, and why would they be worried about it? What does this fear say about them? Genesis 50, beginning at verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them, and spoke kindly to them. 
Joseph's brothers had been living in Egypt for 17 years, and yet when Jacob died, they were afraid that Joseph would take his revenge. The 17 years is expressed in Genesis 47:28, and Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. They realized again how much they had hurt Joseph. Joseph reassured them of his forgiveness again, now after his father's death. This refresher was probably good for Joseph as well as his brothers. If the wound is deep, we will probably need to forgive many times. When memories of the wrong come to mind, we will need to go to God immediately in prayer and make the choice to forgive again. Question, read Genesis 50 and verse 20. How does this verse help explain, at least partially, Joseph's willingness to forgive his brother's sin against him? Genesis 50, verse 20, But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Joseph firmly believed that his life was part of God's big plan to help save the then-known world from famine, and then to help his family fulfil God's promise to become a great nation. Knowing that God had overruled the evil plans of his brothers to bring about good, helped Joseph to forgive. And so to finish the day, Joseph's story has a happy ending. How do we respond when the ending to a story isn't so happy? Or could one argue, long term that is, that with the end of sin and the end of the great controversy, when all issues are solved, it will be a happy ending? How might this hope help us deal with less than ideal endings? Friday, August 13, from the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 239 to 240, As Joseph was sold to the heathen by his own brothers, so Christ was sold to his bitterest enemies by one of his disciples. Joseph was falsely accused and thrust into prison because of his virtue, so Christ was despised and rejected because his righteous, self-denying life was a rebuke to sin. And though guilty of no wrong, he was condemned upon the testimony of false witnesses. And Joseph's patience and meekness under injustice and impression, his ready forgiveness and noble benevolence toward his unnatural brothers, represent the Saviour's uncomplaining endurance of the malice and abuse of wicked men, and his forgiveness not only of his murderers, but of all who have come to him, confessing their sins and seeking pardon. End of quote. And then from Christ's Object Lessons, page 251. Nothing can justify an unforgiving spirit. He who is unmerciful toward others shows that he himself is not a partaker of God's pardoning grace. In God's forgiveness, the heart of the erring one is drawn close to the great soul of infinite love. The tide of divine compassion flows into the sinner's soul and from him to the souls of others. The tenderness and mercy that Christ has revealed in his own precious life will be seen in those who become sharers of his grace. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, someone once said, Not forgiving is like drinking poison while hoping that the other person will die. What does this statement mean? Two, What was the purpose of all the elaborate plans Joseph went through prior to the disclosure of his identity? What did this do for him and for his brothers? 3. Joseph's steward must have been in on some of the plots regarding Joseph's brothers that we read about in Genesis 44, 1-12 earlier in the lesson. How does the experience of forgiveness affect those who are just observers? And 4. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. Desire of Ages, page 224 and 225. 
Think of your own life as you contemplate this statement. How could understanding this help us work through many of the trials and struggles that we face? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Prepare to Meet Thy God and it's by Jessica Seboha Atwell. My six year old son, Asher, approached me at home in Bangkok, Thailand. Mum, I want to hand out flyers to people, he said. After some questioning, I figured out that he wanted to distribute a small Thai language tract called A Love Letter from Jesus. My heart skipped a joyful beat as I realised that my little boy wanted to share his love for Jesus. But Friday didn't seem like a good day. The COVID-19 pandemic was keeping people indoors. In addition, I was preparing for the Sabbath. During my devotions on Sabbath morning, I remembered Ash's request and felt impressed to take him out with the tracts. But I didn't. That afternoon and evening, I watched Sabbath sermons with a friend. One preacher ended his sermon with an appeal from Ellen White, from Gospel Workers, page 52. As a people who believe in Christ's soon coming, we have a message to bear. Prepare to meet thy God. Amos 4, verse 12. That's exactly what I want to tell Thai people, I thought. On Sunday morning, I opened the E.G. White Writings app to read that day's scheduled devotional message. Guess what I read? A passage that included Amos 4.12, Prepare to meet thy God. I was cut to the heart. At breakfast, Asher gazed at me longingly. I promised that he would hand out flyers no matter what. After he memorised Amos 4.12 in Thai, we left. My husband Brian and I had to make a delivery of fresh bread from a bakery at an urban centre of influence that we helped establish after arriving from the United States state of Washington in 2014. Usually, Asher rides around on his bicycle during deliveries, but he announced that he would be too busy. I'll walk and hand out all these, Asher said, referring to the tracts. We began the one mile or 1.6 kilometre walk to the neighbour who had ordered the bread. Asher chased down everyone he saw. Prepare to meet thy God, he exclaimed in Thai, extending tracts to passerbys. Despite COVID-19 worries, no one could refuse the earnest boy. He was ecstatic when we returned home two hours later. He had distributed 100 tracts. I want to do this every day, he declared, smiling. God truly wants the great city of Bangkok and the people of the other big cities of the world to be ready. As a people, we believe in Christ's soon coming. We have a message to bear. Prepare to meet thy God. This story illustrates a key component of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I will go strategic plan. Increased number of church members participating in both personal and public evangelistic outreach initiatives with a goal of total member involvement. Learn more about the strategic plan at iwillgo2020.org. And there's a photograph right here of Asher. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.